Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Welcome to the Monday, May 15th, 2023 Board of Education meeting. We have an action packed agenda tonight. Um, but before we get to it, please take a moment to silence your cell phones, put them on silent airplane mode. And please join Nora Patterson and I in reciting the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you, Nora. All right, uh, let's start with roll call. Absolutely. <clears throat> President McFarland. Here. Vice President Rausch. Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Treasurer Lauterbach. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Ringgold. Here. Okay, uh, we have a quorum, thank you very much. Uh, next up is item two on our agenda, that is the consent agenda. We have item 2.1, the approval of minutes from April 17, 2023 budget <coughs> workshop regular meeting. Item 2.2 is a uh, list of staff being recommended for hire, and it's quite extensive. Please take a minute to look at it in the agenda. Item 2.3 is a employee leave request. Item 2.4 is a list of staff announcing their resignation as well as effective dates. <coughs> Item 2.5 is approval for the payment of the school system's bills in the amount for the month of March 2023 in the amount of $7,186,309. Item 2.6 is approval for legal payments, both of which are itemized in the agenda. Actually, all four of which are itemized in the agenda. And that is it for the consent agenda. At this point, I will accept a motion. I move uh, adoption of the consent agenda. Support. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, support by Mr. Rausch. Any discussion regarding the items in the consent agenda? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, next up is item three, presentations to the board. We have item 3.1. This will be board trustee subcommittee minutes read by Mr. Rausch. Yes, so bear with me. I've got three to read through here. So first meeting subcommittee met on May 3rd to discuss applications for the B Board of Education trustee vacancy in attendance were myself, John Lauterbach and John Hatfield. The subcommittee considered factors outlined in the trustee vacancy application as published on the district's website. Of particular consideration, the committee reviewed factors involving community input, reliance on facts and open-mindedness, emphasis on team decision-making and consensus, represents and reflects deep and abiding faith in the social significance of public education, willingness to listen thoughtfully to others, willingness to express one, one's own opinion and participate in discussions openly and honestly while encouraging and respecting the free expression of opinions by colleagues and willingness to model con continuous learning by taking advantage of development opportunities. Of additional consideration, the subcommittee also looked at the existing composition of the board and to the extent to which it represents the entire community and doesn't surrender to special interests or political groups. The entire community includes citizens who may not have a direct relationship in its public schools. Uh, the subcommittee reviewed 11 total applications and selected interviews to be conducted on May 5th as, as outlined in the minutes. Um, four additional uh, candidates that were not selected for were, were not selected for an interview. The subcommittee wishes to express our gratitude for the willingness to serve our community. Um, Sarah <coughs> worked to schedule interviews for 15 minutes in duration from 12:30 onward, um, scheduled to start at the bottom and top of the hour. 
on May 5th. So that brings me to the May 5th <coughs> subcommittee minutes. Um, in attendance again were myself, John Lauterbach, and Don Hatfield. The subcommittee met at 12.30 p.m. to conduct six, six interviews for the vacant Board of Education position. One of the seven selected candidates um, elected to withdraw from the nomination process. A standard interview guide was used for all candidates, which has three questions in each of the five different categories. A blank interview question guide is attached to the board packet for reference. Questions focused on community input and representation of the community, reliance on facts and open-mindedness, faith in public education, team decision-making and consensus, and willingness to listen and express opinions. Following each interview, the subcommittee drove to consensus scoring for each candidate to help inform our final recommendation decision. Following all the interviews, the committee noted how fortunate the Midland community is to have many great candidates. Ultimately, the committee concluded that Ann Horowitz was the best candidate for recommendation to the full Board of Education for an appointment to the vacant trustee position ending December 31st, 2024. Um, the subcommittee is confident that Ms. Horowitz <coughs> will help to add an additional perspective to the existing composition of the board and will be a great representative, representative of the community. Each candidate interviewed was called and thanked for their willingness to serve the community following the subcommittee meeting. Um, and finally, on May 12th, the committee met again, um, myself, John Lauterbach, and John Hatfield. Following the interviews on May 5th, it came to the board's attention that the subcommittee had made a mistake in its notice procedures. The remaining four applicants were contacted and scheduled for interviews on May 12th. Three applicants were interviewed and one applicant rescinded their application due to a conflict of interest holding additional public office. There are nine applicants available to the Board of Education to select from for appointment to the vacant trustee position. After careful review and discussion, the subcommittee determined that four candidates in particular would make good Board of Education members, great Board of Education members. Anna Horowitz, because of her professional role at one of the largest employers in the community, she has a broad perspective of regulatory constraint. She has kids entering the school district, in particular at Central Park, where the board currently does not have representation, and a great network throughout the community, <coughs> community through various organizations. Dr. Shauna Patterson St Stevens, because of her <coughs> educational background in managing DEI initiatives at higher education and her perspective and advocacy for public education. She also leaned in to help the board in managing various policies over the last few months. Emily Brown, because of her public school experience as an elementary teacher, her relentless advocacy for children, and understanding of the role that public education plays in creating great citizens to be future leaders of this community. And then Nicole Guerrero, because of her involvement in volunteering in our buildings today. Her marketing and communications background could be a great addition to the board, and she brings a perspective of public education from outside this community. Subcommittee, and I, this part, I cannot understate enough, or overstate enough. The subcommittee would like to, again, state publicly that every applicant was fantastic to speak with, and I truly mean that. We received great perspective from diverse candidates, and all candidates would make positive impacts in the public schools. Okay, thank you, Phil, and again, thank you to the uh, board trustee subcommittee for all the hard work uh, you guys have put in. I, I, I and uh, the rest of us appreciate it. Uh, so that, that'll bring us to item 3.2. This is for board action. This is a nomination for candidate to fill the board trustee vacancy. As the subcommittee minutes stated, 11 applicants, applications of interest to fill the vacancy for the MPS Board of Education trustee seat were received. Two of the applicants have since rescinded their application. Each Board of Education trustee has received all <coughs> 11 applications to review, as well as the subcommittee minutes, which were just read. 
The nine remaining applicants are available to be nominated by a current Board of Education trustee tonight. At this point, I will open the floor for nominations. I nominate Ann Horowitz. Support. Are there any other nominations? Okay. All in f ah, actually, this is a roll call vote. Ro yeah, roll call. Roll call. All right. President McFarland? Yes. Vice President Rausch? Yes. Secretary Hatfield is yes. Treasurer Lauterbach? Yes. Member Blasey? Yes. Member Ringgold? Yes. All right. Unanimous. We have a unanimous decision. Okay. Excellent. At this point, um, Anne, please join us. And Sarah is going to administer the oath of office. After which you'll take your seat. So I took the pledge of allegiance and repeat after me. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this state and the Constitution of this state. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of member of the Board of Education of office of the. Of the office of, member of, the of, office the of the member of the Board of Education. Of Midland Public Schools according to the best of my ability. Of Midland Public Schools according to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Okay, you can sit next to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Welcome. Okay, Mike. 3.4, Shining Stars. Yes, our monthly Shining Stars. And our first one is Ethan Church, if Ethan would come up and join me. Ethan, as I always say, you could stand here awkwardly and hang out while we say all kinds of good stuff about you. So, Ethan was nominated for a Shining Star by an MPS colleague. Among their comments were the following. Ethan is such an amazing paraprofessional. His rapport with the students in the Emotionally Impaired program is a huge part of their success. Not only does Ethan develop relationships with students in the classroom, he also interacts with students during the lunch recess by playing football or basketball with them as well. Ethan is an integral team member of the Emotionally Impaired program. He goes above and beyond what is expected, and he's always kind, caring, respectful, and professional. He has a real connection with staff and students of all ages at Central Park. Ethan is a real asset to our team. Congratulations, Ethan. You get all this stuff. Our second shining star is Lori. Lori Kraut, if you can come up, Lori. And I get to read nice things about Lori, so in her smiling face that we always see. Lori joined the MPS team in 1992 as a teacher at Adams Elementary, where she was currently teaches first grade. She has taught both kindergarten and first grade in her time at MPS. Lori earned both her bachelor's and master's degree from Central Michigan University. Lori plans to retire from MPS on June 30th with 31 years of service. Lori Kraut is an amazing first grade teacher at Adams Elementary. Ms. Kraut goes above and beyond to meet each of her students' individual needs. Helping students grow in their reading ability is a passion for Ms. Kraut. She works with students both in class and outside tutoring sessions to help them overcome barriers to learning. Every student in her class feels loved and accepted every day. Thank you for being awesome, Ms. Kraut. Congratulations, Lori. say this because she started teaching when she was 15. <laughs> Lori was my first grade teacher. <laughs> okay, next up we have item 3.5. This is our 2015 school bond construction report. We have Daryl from Barton Mallow in person and I think we have Dale Jerome. Um, he will be available to yeah, he's going to have some speaking parts, and he'll be available for questions as well. Great. 
So good evening. Um, my name is Daryl Dombrow. I uh, work for Bart Mal. I'm a project executive, and I've served in various roles on the bond program going back to 2014, so in those initial planning phases. So it's hard to believe that I'm standing here a decade, almost a decade later, um, bringing another update to the board. Um, I was a young man without kids back then, and so now I'm, I've got gray hair, and not because of the job or Midland Public Schools, but just uh, you know, I'm aging, so it's been it's been a long time. So excited to be here and talk about this next major milestone, um, which is the completion of Series Two projects. So uh, the bond was sold in three series. Um, uh, the Series Three was sold in May, and so I'm going to go through kind of some of the highlights of Series of the Series Two projects. So when um, the district originally went out to the public, there was kind of five major pillars. Uh, that they wanted to achieve with the bond program. And so I'm going to talk about some of the projects within those five pillars. There was safety and security, energy efficiency, healthy learning environments. And so really when you start going through, you start thinking about how, um, you know, the foresight that the district and the board had when you start seeing some of these categories, so kind of well in advance of some other districts. Um, addressing vacant buildings and properties. So the district had some old facilities and it was kind of time to start that replacement cycle. And then a real you know, heavy uh, look at technology, so the 21st century classrooms. Uh, improved safety and security, so secure entrances were placed at um, all of the um, student occupied facilities. Um, access control and video surveillance was installed, and so there was a big push early on. Uh, these projects were completed by 2018. Um, there was over, numbers straight over 600 cameras and 50 secure um, access points were installed as part of that project um, improved traffic flow is a really important part as well so separating those uh, traffic loops separating the parents from the bus loops um, that was you know often done by adding additional loops and additional paving but sometimes that was done through curbs and signage um, but that was especially completed at the five elementary schools um, a district-wide public address system, IP-based system, so the district now has the ability to broadcast um, um, out to all of the buildings through one central location. So those were kind of the five big security projects that were completed at that time. Um, increasing energy efficiency. So um, Mike Mogenberg was a big part of this, so I'm going to talk about some of the equipment and systems that were put in place and the results of that, uh, but those were just tools, so really hats off to the operations. Um, department as you see the results of some of this. Hey, Daryl, so, will you yeah. clarify who Mike Mogenberg is so these people know? Oh, Mike Mogenberg is the Director of Operations and has been really influential through all of the decision-making processes through all of these projects. So he's an employee here at Midland Public Schools, so he's yep. the one that he's speaking of. Absolutely, yep. So um, as part of that inefficient equipment, really kind of the, in systems, that really falls into two categories. Equipment replacement, uh, over 230 pieces of mechanical equipment, and 20 boilers were replaced, as well as the building management system. So that um, process started back in 2015, was one of the first projects out to bid and really was the roadmap up until completion um, of the district-wide system um, that you see that's in place today. Um, so the window replacement, um, there was a lot of single-pane win single windows throughout the district. The district completed over $4 million in window replacement as part of the bond program. And so putting those two things in place and, again, having those tools, um, as we sit today, nine out of the ten buildings have an energy start rating of 79 or higher. And when you start looking back at, you know, what an accomplishment that is, um, I think the average today is about 81 would be the number. And so that number, 81, means that you are better than 81 percent of uh, the facilities that are of similar makeup, you know, adjusted for, um, adjusted for climate and location. And so now where you sat back in 2015, about 51 was the average. So if you think about that, that's a, that's a massive increase. And a lot of those numbers mean that you're, you're doing some good things, but really where the rubber hits the road is cost. So when you look at the utility costs, the district's budget for utilities has been unchanged since 2015. And so um, new equipment, new tools, and the district has really stepped up and used those in order to achieve um, those two goals. Um, healthy learning environments. Um, again, we talked about the mechanical equi equipment replacement in the building management system, but that was also put in place to improve the indoor, indoor air quality. So today, all of the classrooms in the district meet the Michigan Mechanical Code for outdoor air requirements, so that's introducing um, fresh air. So when you think about what we've just kind of gone through, the district was thinking about those in healthy learning environments as far back as 2015. Um, and Dale, is, can Dale speak right now? 
And I think Dale wanted yeah, to add something else to this. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add in, you know, the 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 why behind a lot of these, in addition to being energy efficiency and energy savings, is really improving uh, the educational environment. And uh, we do know that uh, studies and research shows that when you improve the air quality, when you have a more comfortable and more healthy building, you get better learning outcomes. So that's kind of the why behind a lot of the energy improvements and that were made in this last bond issue. Um, addressing vacant buildings and properties, so four, uh, which today would be 70 plus year old facilities were taken offline. Um, by combining East Lawn and the old Central Middle School, taking those buildings down and opening up uh, Central Park Elementary, the average age of an M MPS facility has been reduced by nearly a decade. So again, just kind of looking forward to um, you know, reducing the age of the facilities. Uh, create 21st century learning environments. Um, new wireless network was installed and new servers in the district head end. In the classroom technology, uh, over 280 classrooms have received new uh, projectors and sound enhancement systems. Uh, 11,000 staff and student devices were imaged and deployed and put in the district in a one-to-one -one position uh, as part of the 2015 program. And then uh, Dale's going to talk a little bit about the media centers and maker spaces. Yeah, thanks, Daryl. Yeah, as I'm sure you're aware, um, we, we did touch every media center within the district. Um, the goal was uh, to do a, a refresh of you, if you will, on the idea of what a media center is in today's educational environment, um, trying to push those into becoming more collaborative learning, um, wherever it makes sense, project-based learning opportunities within the footprint of the media center. So each media center uh, was uh, kind of reimagines to have areas like whole group learning and instruction, small group instruction, individual focus areas, and what I refer to as life areas or where you can conduct project-based uh, learning within the footprint of the media center. And it takes a different form at each grade level, elementary, middle school, and high school, but those four types of spaces are now embedded in each of your media centers. Also maker spaces, we looked for ways to, within the footprint of all of your existing buildings, uh, especially the elementary schools, incorporate maker spaces. And in some cases that was made possible by some of the uh, additions that we did to some of the other buildings that I'll talk about here next. Uh, so some additional improvements that maybe didn't fall so neatly into those categories were the athletic improvements, such as the replacement of the synthetic track um, and turf uh, surfaces. Uh, we did over a million square feet of asphalt and concrete pavement across the district, so really significant investments in um, asphalt, asphalt or concrete sidewalks, concrete curbs um, on all of the projects. Uh, bus uh, purchases, the district's purchased over 19, or excuse me, has purchased 19 buses in both 65 and 77 passenger. Um, and Series 3, uh, which was just sold, would be an additional budget for 24 buses. Um, so Dale's going to talk a, a little bit about a few of the featured projects. Yeah, thanks, Daryl. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, um, Central Park Elementary was probably in many ways for your district and, and certainly for architectural and uh, construction management team, kind of one of those once in a lifetime opportunities uh, to start with a clean slate. And uh, after the bond pass, um, the idea of a STEM specific elementary school surfaced. And um, at that point in time, as Daryl said, it was now eight, almost 10 years ago, there really weren't any um, any places to copy, if you will. Uh, we did visit a couple of facilities in different places in the country, but really had to start with kind of a, a clean slate and imagine what a STEM specific elementary school would look like. And uh, I think the results uh, do speak for themselves, mainly from your use as educators um, to see what goes on inside that building is incredibly exciting, I'm sure, for all of you. But just here to highlight, the building has received a great deal of notoriety, uh, both uh, in the state of Michigan and even um, nationally. Uh, and you can see listed there some of the awards that that project has been given. Um, 
Another part, really part of that same project was um, in demoing the exist what was at its last uh, uh, use before being closed, the middle school um, in the district. Uh, we did take a look at the existing auditorium space and some of the surrounding spaces and felt that there was a good opportunity there for the district to save and create what is now uh, referred to as Central Auditorium. Um, it was a was and is really a beautiful example of an Art Deco uh, type of space, both the lobby and the auditorium itself um, do have that nice Art Deco quality to them. But what it really lacked was current day um, technology, if you will, to function as a good performing arts center. So you can see there the, some of the items listed, uh, over 4.5 million in improvements were added to that part of the facility that was saved to improve acoustics, you know, put a new band shell in place, new AV system, and new um, lighting and sound systems. And I think, again, it's, it really is, is nice to see that, that part of that building be, to be saved and have its next life as a really um, very nice uh, performing arts facility. Then the last thing just wanted to highlight is, again, I'm sure you're all very familiar with these projects, but just to kind of highlight things. In addition to the work that was done at Central Park to create a new elementary school, a STEM-specific elementary school, we wanted to then um, translate some of those same opportunities and some same type of spaces into your existing elementary school. So as I mentioned a while ago, the maker space area we kind of started down what I, you know, it's kind of like a domino effect of planning process where the existing library or media center became the STEM lab and or maker space. The gym cafeteria became the new media center. And then we added on the uh, cafeteria and gym spaces with the stage at one end to provide that new space and really overlay the same concepts that are available to students at um, Central Park Elementary onto all of your existing elementary schools. Thanks, Dale. Um, and then, you know, just a, another measure of, uh, and an important measure of how well the projects have gone would just be, you know, how the money was handled in, in a fiscally responsible way. So um, not only completing the projects on time, but in this case, under budget as well. So we had consistent contingency and bid savings. That's a testament to the district and the team, um, you know, putting the proper schedules to, together, putting the appropriate documents together so that, um, so that after award, uh, the projects were completed within budget. Uh, the district outpaced um, their projections for earned interest. So managing the money wisely while it wasn't being spent, managing the cash flow during the construction process, resulting in about a 12% savings program-wide, uh, which is about $14 million in additional projects. So a list of those, a uh, few of those projects. Uh, Dale mentioned that, you know, the kind of that STEM concept came in after the vote. So the, you know, what we co started calling back then the STEMification of Central Park Elementary was really an additional cost to the project. Uh, we completed over $2 million in additional mechanical equipment. An example of that would be you know, 20 additional air handlers we did at uh, Dow High. Uh, over 65 restrooms renovated. This is one of the more recent projects. So both staff, um, um, student restrooms, as well as like the individual restrooms within the elementary. So a lot of those portions of the building remained untouched after the, you know, the completion of the bond workless uh, projects. And so we went in after the fact with the additional dollars to, uh, to help renovate and add some life to those. Um, additional asphalt and concrete paving was completed. Um, building envelope improvements, so new coatings or metal cladding on, the, on, on some of the buildings to improve the envelope and um, you know, increase the longevity of the facilities. Um, athletic upgrades, some of the projects were additional. This would be more of an enhancement to a project we were going to do. So the original uh, budget and original plan for the tennis courts would have been asphalt paving, um, but we looked at doing post-tension concrete and you know, tripling the life of, of that project. So just really identifying areas where, you know, not only additional projects, but improving the quality of the projects you were gonna do. Um, and then door and hardware placement. We placed an additional 165 doors, uh, primarily uh, throughout the secondary facilities. 
And that list is much longer and, and available to, to the board. And so just, you know, a thank you. It's been really, uh, I mentioned earlier all the time I've been here, it's really been a pleasure, you know, working with uh, Mr. Shero, Mr. Bruton, uh, Dave Dijek in technology, Mike Wogenberg, like we mentioned. Um, really a, a team approach here. You don't, um, you know, you don't save that kind of money and hit the dates like we hit, um, you know, without everybody working together and, and holding up their end of the bargain. So, um, you know, thank you very much. Any questions or comments? I just have a comment for our public more than anything. You know, the, the energy efficiency improvements strike me because we see it in our state bulletin 1014 data where the amount of expenditure that we spend on facilities and, and our expense budget for heating and cooling is quite low in comparison to all the other buildings in the state, which means that we can take those funds and mm -hmm. spend them on our students. Right? And we're always trying to focus on how do we spend more dollars of our budget in the educational classroom to get outcomes, right? So yeah. huge thank you to our community. Phil, yeah. just an add on that. So our energy costs have not gone up, but yet we had added air conditioning to every classroom in the district. And there was, I think, Dow High and Woodcrest might have been the only two buildings with AC prior mm -hmm. to this project yeah. as well. So and square footage. Yeah. yeah. So and square footage. We added 320,000 square feet of air conditioning as part of the project. Um, and in spite of that, the energy costs have not changed. Yeah. The other, the other thing that I was thinking about just in because we're getting into budget season, is one of the potentials is for further expansion of uh, breakfast and lunch. Thank God we have cafeterias at all of our buildings now, mm -hmm. because in theory we should be able to hit the ground running with that if that comes mm -hmm. through the state budget as well. Yeah, and good one to point out because I think many pe parents, younger parents, certainly don't know that our we did not have cafeterias mm -hmm. at all. So, okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right. Next up, we have item four. This is an information only. This is um, superintendent search process, which Phil is going to talk us through. Yes. Sarah's going to pull up a quick presentation. All right. So <clears throat> the Superintendent search process, this was in your board packet, so mm -hmm. uh, probably reviewed it ahead of time. So myself, Mr. Blazy, and Mr. McFarland had met to review kind of what we've seen uh, nationally and in the state. Brad had highlighted a number of different districts in the state that are going through this process right now as well. And we had broken this up into um, the following slides further detail this, but kind of three big uh, milestones. So one is finding a search firm to help the board um, conduct a search to make sure that our community knows what it wants and we get the community's input. Um, but to, to go find a firm to help us do that. And then the second big bucket is develop that selection criteria. So this would include community input sessions, staff input sessions, um, and making sure that we develop the, the, basically the job description and criteria for who we're gonna select, interview and select. And then finally, um, the su actual superintendent selection and negotiation of the contract. So Sarah, you can go ahead to the next slide. So this details that first um, outline for the search firm selection. So this summer, our plan would be to begin writing an RFP for a request for proposal, I should be careful with acronyms. Request for proposal for a search firm, possibly even reach out to other districts for feedback on what worked well, what didn't work well. Um, continue that writing process in July. In August, <coughs> the search firm, uh, we would send out the search RFP, uh, would be in the in your board packet for information, and the board, the full board would get to review that RFP and uh, provide input. September, we would probably do a targeted RFP based on feedback that we're seeing in the marketplace and feedback from other districts. Um, probably five 
ish firms. Um, we'll, we'll determine that as we continue to work through. Um, October, we would narrow down the RFP responses to three firms and interview the firms um, to make a final selection. And in November, the search firm is selected and begins would begin community input sessions. Then that begins kind of the second tranche of, of activity. So um, I highlight this is subject to change as we work with the search firm. But um, November and December, we would begin those community staff and community input sessions on the job, job description and the kind of the qualifications that we're looking for in a candidate. And then in January, um, we'd finish up those community input sessions and then do a job posting. Um, and, and we would start the recruiting process at that point in time. So that gets us through search firm selection and then the community input. And then the third tranche, or the third, the third milestone would actually be to do the selection process. So in February, um, we would down select superintendent candidates uh, from our search with the search firm and begin interviewing. March, we would probably do final interviews of superintendent candidates. April and May, uh, select the superintendent and negotiate a contract so that a permanent superintendent would be seated uh, come July. Mm -hmm. So any, you know, this is for information, but also for input from the rest of the board, but any questions? I don't. Straight forward. Yeah. Okay. Well thought out process. It's Thank a you. lot of work. Yeah. Having gone through this, I can tell you yep. we are going to be busy. Um, so let's get ready. I'm excited. Okay, Phil. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to our next item. This is an action item. This is um, our interim superintendent. Uh, you have all received a copy of the proposed contract of employment for the interim superintendent. As board president, it's my recommendation that this board adopt that contract and appoint Penny Miller Nelson as Midland Public Schools' next interim superintendent. Do I you need a motion in that regard? Yes, I do. So moved. Support. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach. Support by Ms. Ringold. This is not a roll call, right? No. Mike? Okay. Any additional discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Penny, <coughs> congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you for putting your trust in me. I'm really excited to lead our school community. You know, this is a really special place. I know you all know that. We have great, great students, for starters, great staff, great, great group of educators and parents and community partners and a strong vision that I'm committed to and excited to lead us for the next six months to year, it looks like, depending on our timeline. Um, and just want to extend uh, my appreciation to you all. It's, it's going to be fun, and it's going to be great. Thank you. Right, thank, you. thank you, Penny. OK, moving on, we are at item six, request to address the board. And first up is Joe Bonides. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Hello. I have a couple of areas to cover tonight. Uh, first, I read the application for the replacement school board candidates uh, using resources from Michigan School Board Association, the ones that are okay with parents being called domestic terrorists. Uh, many call outs for in that application were candidates with an agenda need not apply. Well, I would propose that a DEI, DEI overall else person on that agenda should not have be qualified. Uh, if you go down to Diversity Road, another DEI campaigner is the least diverse thing you could do. Uh, lastly, you have chosen a lawyer for this slot, which means that the board now has three lawyers on it, maybe too many. Second, I need to apologize to the board. I called you negligent for not already having a job posting for the new superintendent. I did not see how you were being played by the superintendent to tie your hands on the retirement 
which Mr. Lauterbach described as common knowledge last fall during the debate. I th will thank Mr. Blasey for raising the issue at the last meeting to get the process going. He probably gained us 30 days. Uh, and I'm very glad to hear that he is on the search committee as the only one who actually was pushing the process. I will now claim that the president of this board was negligent in having no idea what the steps were to hiring a new superintendent and had to have his hand held by Mr. Shero through the process. Mr. Shero providing grim predictions of what the process speed would, could be and laying the groundwork for a maximal interim period. I wish the new superintendent good luck as we go through the next year. I hope she can help MPS recover from the abuse the kids have gone through these last three years. Thank you. Next up, Isla McCubbin Green. Hi, Isla. Hello, my name is Isla McCubbin Green, and I'm here to talk to you today about dual enrollment and how it's weighted in the student's GPA and how I believe we can improve it. To begin, a little bit of background dual enrollment is a student taking college courses for both college and high school credits. Across MPS, regular high school courses, there Courses can be honors, accelerated, or regular, and this affects how it's weighted in a student's GPA. For example, if you take all honors courses and get A's in them, you'll have a 5.0 weighted GPA. If you take all regular and get an A, you'll have a 4.0. Currently, dual enrollment courses are weighted as accelerated, which is a very recent development and they used to be regular. Um, even though students are taking courses with accelerated curriculum, they're taking college courses with other college students with college level expectations and rigor, Students are getting the weight in their GPA to reflect that their courses are not as hard as high school. Today, I'd like to propose that all dual enrollment courses that are three credits and above are weighted as honors courses in a student's GPA. This is because of several reasons. First of all, all AP classes or advanced placement classes that are offered at the high schools are honors courses and College Board, the creator of AP classes, does offer equivalencies to college courses on their website and state that they're like AP Computer Science A is equivalent to a one semester introductory college science, um, computer science course at college, which if those are equivalent, college is equivalent to AP, this should both be weighted as an honors course and the student's GPA. Not only that, but unfortunately, MPS doesn't have a super well developed an evaluation system or appeal process to the weight of a dual enrollment course. I myself spent six months trying to get a dual enrollment course I took re-evaluated, only after that period to be told no concrete reason why my course couldn't be honors. Having all three credit courses and above for dual enrollment be honors courses makes it easier for the district to evaluate, um, for the district and it's a tried and true system. I myself was able to talk to several superintendents across the state of Michigan, like Lansing and Dearborn, who have all dual enrollment courses weighted as honors in their GPA. And it works well for them because it helps to acknowledge the work that students are putting into their courses for that l higher level of curriculum because this does affect students. Our weighted GPA determines a lot of things like our if you're the top 10%, your class ranking, cum laude even, because you can take 10 dual enrollment courses through your high school career. That can have a huge effect on your weighted GPA. And so I hope, I ask that you all consider that all dual enrollment courses that are three credits and above be weighted as honors courses. I'm out of my time now, but if you have any questions at all, please contact me. You have my phone number, you have my email, and I have so much more I'd love to share to you, with you. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Renita Bonadies. Good evening. Um, I've received the agenda packets for the past 15 months and paid the <coughs> fees as we've not been given an allowable exemption for those fees. At the April school board meeting, there were several public comments made about a possible school board seat like how it is handled in the process. One speaker even went on about how the community would not want anyone that wasn't completely on board with the DEI agenda that this school district pushes and has embraced. My question to this board is, how did they know about a possible seat becoming vacant? The information about Lynn's resignation to take effect immediately was not on the agenda, 
nor was it in the agenda packet we received. So how did this particular group hear about this opening? Was this information leaked to a certain group so they could make comments and sway the committee? Was this a breach of confidential information by a board member to their select group? Is that a violation of their position? I've requested the next six months of agenda packets and told it will be again another $278. There is a section in the Freedom of Information Act that allows this FOIA request that it could be fulfilled for free if the information is for the general use of the public. I make this information available on a few public sources with over 1,200 members when I receive it at no charge to the public. There is information that we find in the packets that is never made public at the board meetings, but is re relevant to know. Like last year, the whole 27 pages of the continuity of learning plan was in the packet, but was never discussed or voted on at the board meetings. So we would not have known anything about it without having subscribed to that. I certainly understand that there is some time and cost involved to fulfill the FOIA request. I guess when I sit here and hear how much money the district has spent and has been able to save, it would seem that taking this little bit of money from a citizen of this community is unnecessary. Our tax dollars should be more than enough to cover a request for information that is be, being used publicly. The argument is that there is adequate transparency without this being given out for free, but as I mentioned, there is information that we wouldn't know without receiving these documents. That's not real public transparency. And yet again, I would like to point out that the board president is manipulating the sign-in sheet with the order in which we signed in. Thank you. Justin Doty. Good evening, Justin. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Justin Dowdy, and I'm a sixth grade teacher at Jefferson Middle School. My wife, Sarah Dowdy, is a third grade teacher at Woodcrest Elementary and Gerstacker recipient. I'm also a father of two boys who attend school in this district, one at Jefferson and one at Woodcrest. I'm currently finishing up year seven here with MPS and year 16 overall. I'm here today to speak my mind in a public forum to let you all know how I and many others feel in this district when it comes to who you will choose for our next superintendent. So here's your first staff input. <laughs> Just please don't forget what I'm about to say. I know it's a process. I want you to look for a superintendent that has a history of working with staff and not against staff. I want you to look for someone who visits the buildings and actually talks to the teachers. How are you doing? What do you need? How can we give you a better opportunity to have a positive impact on your students academically and socially? I worked at Central Park Elementary for the first two years it was open. The only time I saw Mr. Sherrill in our building is when he was giving a tour to a bunch of other suit and ties. I want someone who takes mental health seriously for our staff and students. If any of you were at the opening meeting this year, our district brought in a speaker who talked about how educators have been given more and more tasks throughout their career, and that educational systems and policies have continued to add to the list of teachers' responsibilities. To us teachers, it was almost hilarious. How hypocritical can we be? This district does just that. It adds to the list. If you really take mental health seriously for our staff, you will reduce the burden put on the teachers and take items off the list. It seems that the expectation still exists that teachers are supposed to stay at school for hours when kids leave. I can't speak for everyone, but when my work day is done, my, my work is done and my family takes priority. We most definitely need more counselors and social workers in our schools. These positions in our district are extremely understaffed and overworked. We all have students who have been abused in many ways. We have students who struggle with depression. We have students who need assistance at home. We all have students who just need help. As teachers, we are left to just figure it out. You say you can't hire more counselors and social workers because of the cost. My message to you is figure it out. You are putting a savings account over the needs of our children. Since I have worked here, there has always been a line in the sand between downtown administration and staff. How can we do what's best for kids if we don't listen to each other? Mr. Sherrill made a comment a few months ago during the board meeting that discussed the Jefferson Diversity Days debacle. His comment was, if you keep treating your leaders like this, you won't have any more. Have you not noticed what's going on with the teachers in this district and everywhere else? We have great teachers leaving this district every year for other jobs with less stress. They are leaving for jobs where they feel valued because here at MPS we feel like we're just a number. I was not surprised at all when he made that comment because it seems to always be about him and how he saved this district from financial destruction, how he brought us back. Oh, sorry, your teachers paid the sacrifices to bring us back. 
The main reason this district does well is because of the outstanding teachers that we have in front of our kids. It's not because of PYP, PLTW, a new STEM school, it's the teachers. Our jobs become more difficult, more stressful each year. The future of our staff and students rests in your hands. Please choose wisely. Thank you. Okay, that's the end of the written list that I have. I know some of you came in late. Is there anybody else who wishes to address the board before we move on? Okay, we'll close the floor. Moving on, we are at curriculum instruction and assessment, item 7.1. We have minutes from the study committee, uh, which occurred April 17, 2023, read by Brad. Uh, CIA study committee minutes. April 17th was our meeting date. Uh, members present were Lynn Baker, Brad Blazy, Jennifer Ringgold, Penny Miller Nelson, and Mike Sharl. Guests present were Kevin Dodick, DeAndre Hogan, Jeff Jaster, and Tracy Speaker Kirstheimer. Uh, we met at the Building Trades Program House, 300 East Ashman Street. I'm sure many people have driven by it over the year, over the year, the last couple of years. They've been in the same spot. Our start time was 1:30. So we went through the building trades program. So committee members toured the building, trades house, and talked with the students and Mr. Dodick about their experiences. This year's project is in partnership with the Reese Endeavor in Midland. Um, we also got a diversity, equity, inclusion update. DeAndre Hogan shared that the Dow High Human Library and Jefferson Voices of our community events were successful. In support of ongoing recruitment efforts, a team from Midland Public Schools recently attended a recruitment event at Howard University. Uh, our meeting adjourned at 2.30, and uh, our next meeting was May 15th, which was today. All right, thank you, Mr. Blazy. I do uh, have to say the Building Trades Program was pretty awesome. It was a great tour, and those kids are doing a phenomenal job out there. So hats off to them. Okay, item 7.2 is an action item. This is staff and curriculum development proposals. Ms. Miller Nelson. All right, we have for action the staff and curriculum development proposals that were brought to you last month for information. There are 23 proposals uh, and I read them last time, so I'll spare you reading them again, but they're listed clearly in the agenda. These represent uh, the areas that have been identified as need for either curriculum development or staff professional learning and they range from some literacy work which we learned about today in our CIA committee meeting to play-based learning to supporting our life 101 courses so a, a variety of opportunities uh, so I'll ask for your action on those I want to remind you that these of course are pending final budget approval Okay, thank you. I will accept the motion regarding item 7.2. I vote that we accept item 7.2, the uh, staff and curriculum development proposals. Support. Motion by Mr. Hatfield, support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any further discussion for item 7.2? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Next action item is 7.3. Penny? Yes, textbook adoptions. If you're working from a printed copy of the agenda, we have a slight revision to that. If you're on your digital copy, that should be accurate. So the books that are actually for your consideration for action tonight are the Algebra 2 text, uh, which is from Big Ideas. There is an Algebra 2 and geometry, or excuse me, Trigonometry Honors text, which is from Cengage. And then there is an Algebra 1 text from Big Ideas. It's just those three texts, not the chemistry book that's listed. Okay, thank you. I will accept the motion for item 7.3. Make a motion to approve item 7.3, approval of Algebra 2. Sorry, I'll just say this a different way. As stated in our digital copy, which shows integrated math 3 and 4, Algebra 2, Algebra 2 accelerated, then a second book for Algebra 2 and Trigonometry, and a third book for Algebra 1, 8th grade. Support. Good. Motion by Mr. Roush, support by Ms. Ringgold. Any additional discussion regarding item 7.3? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, continuing with 7.4, information yeah. only. So this one is for information, and it will be uh, subject to the 28-day review period, and it will be available 
right outside my office for anyone who wants to look at this. This book is for our AP Advanced Chemistry course. The title of the text is Chemistry, a Molecular Approach. It's by Pearson with a copyright of 2023. This followed our typical uh, recommendation and referral process with teachers, teacher leaders, and principals reviewing the text. Uh, so this will come back to you next month for action. Okay, thanks Penny. Uh, next up we have item 8.1, FFO Study Committee Minutes, read by Mr. Lauterbach. Thank you, Scott. Uh, May 1st, 2023, the FFO Committee met. Uh, March financials were reviewed. Re revenue variances were attributed to the timing of the winter taxes. Uh, at the receipt of one-time retirement flow-through funds, purchase card and purchase orders over the bid threshold were reviewed. French and Associates and Barton Mallow will present the initial findings from the facility study at the June 5th FFO meeting. A recap of the 2015 bond will be presented at the May Board of Education meeting. Administration will recommend adoption of the resolution expressing support of the Midland County Educational Service Agency budget at the May Board of Education meeting. The committee discussed funding for various student fees in the 23-24 school year. Comparisons of the current proposals were presented to the committee, I'm sorry, the House and Senate school aid fund budgets proposals were presented to the committee. The foundation allowance uh, increase ranged from 4 to 6 percent. All budgets contain continued funding for mental health, school safety, and universal free breakfast and lunch. Administration sought committee feedback on fiscal data related to staff salary formulas, numerous one-time revenues and expenditures in the current budget are forecasted to have unintended impacts on the 23-24 compensation levels. The administration will present the salary letter at the formula maximums for full board action. And our next meeting will be June 5th at 5 p.m. Excellent, thank you. Next up, item 8.2 is an action item, the Midland County ESA budget, 23-24 budget. Uh, Mr. Bruton. Thank you, President McFarland. Um, each and every single year, um, by law, our Board of Education has to either adopt a resolution in support of or not in support of our local ESA's budget. Um, I will spare you the details as we do the heavy lifting on that for you. We met with the ESA officials for approximately three hours and went through their budget line by line. Your very high level recap is that their compensation for their staff, their revenues and their expenditures are in line with our expectations and are in line with what we see coming in the state budgets. <clears throat> Excuse me. They break their budgets into two pieces. They have a general fund budget and they have a special education fund budget. For their general fund budget, as you see in your report, um, it is nearly balanced with an expected ending of 11.7 in their fund balance and their special education is nearly balanced as well too with an expected um, balance at the end of the year of 16.3%. So we are recommending, after a very thorough review of their budget, that this Board of Education adopts a resolution in support of the ESA budget for the next fiscal year. Okay, thank you. I will accept the motion for item 8.2. Make a motion to accept uh, Midland County Educational Service Agency 23-24 budget. I'll support. Motion by Mr. Roush, support by Mr. Hatfield. Any additional discussion for <coughs> 8.2? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you very much. Uh, next action item is 8.3, this is seal coating bid, Mr. Bruton. Thank you. Um, for your consideration this evening, we're bringing to you bids relating to seal coating. Um, this also includes crack sealing and painting at areas throughout MPS, areas receiving work within this bid project will be Central Auditorium, Chestnut Hill, Dow High, Midland High, Siebert, and Woodcrest. After going through the bid process, we are recommending issuing a purchase order to Zenneberg Asphalt of Mount Pleasant, Michigan for a total of $89,366.58. And if approved this evening, Series 2 bond funds will be utilized to complete this project. Okay, thank you. I will accept the motion for item 8.3. I move adoption of Item 8.3, awarding the uh, asphalt, uh, or I'm sorry, seal coating purchase order to Zenneberg Asphalt of Mount Pleasant, Michigan in the amount of $89,366.58. Support. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, support by Mrs. Ringgold. Any additional discussion for item 8.3? I had a quick question, and this is real high level. How many, 
how much money do we have left yet to spend in Series 2? We're down to a couple, couple hundred thousand or below. Okay. That's all I needed. And we're trying to move it now. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up is a item 8.4. This is a gift item totaling $11,000. Mr. Bruton. We are asking for your approval to accept um, one gift this evening. It's above our threshold, needing approval of $5,000. This is a gift of an item from Laura Curry. Um, she has offered to donate to the Midland High um, Athletic Program a 2011 John Deere XUV um, dedicated in her request to the softball program. The expressed value for that vehicle is $11,000, and we would appreciate your action allowing us to accept this gift on behalf of Midland Public tonight. Okay. Make a motion to approve acceptance of the gifts, the gift totaling $11,000 from Laura Curry. Support. Motion by Mr. Rausch, support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any additional discussion regarding 8.4? Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Curry. Yes. <laughs> All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Next up is information, gifts totaling $8,931.48, Mr. Bruton. Thank you. Um, for information only on behalf of the board and also administration, we wish to express our gratitude for 23 gifts totaling $8,931.48 this evening. The gifts span a wide range of items from support for the BPA program at Midland High various field trips, athletic equipment, and many food service scholarships. Per tradition, each donor will be recognized in the broadcast credits of this evening's meeting and also through official board correspondence. Thank you to all of our generous donors. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we have human resources, item 9.1, study committee minutes. Phil. Yep, so we, the committee met on April 14th in room nine, uh, present were myself, John Hatfield, Jennifer Ringel, Mike Shero, Brian Boutin, Karen Justin, Justin and Penny Miller Nelson. Um, first item was 2324 staffing update, the first round of staffing meetings with building and central buildings and central administration were held the week before spring break. The HR team has hired 20 new staff members for the 2324 school year to date. There are at that time there were 10 positions remaining to be filled. Active recruitment will continue throughout the spring and summer. Item two was the AKA sorority partnership with an EMU partnership update. The committee was updated on the recent collaborate, collaborative events held with Eastern Michigan University and Alpha Kappa Alpha. These partnerships aim to attract a diverse pool of candidates for open MPS positions. The HR team and Director Hogan traveled to Howard University on a recruiting visit in April. And finally, the third item was para paraprofessional negotiations update. The committee was briefed on the status of negotiations with the Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals. Five sessions have been held to date. Meetings are scheduled to occur bi-weekly. The next FFO or next HR meeting is scheduled uh, for the 23-24 school year. <coughs> that the correct list? Yeah, we just need to note the update. We had a typo in the very last line, so we'll make that update. Okay. Because it says 22-23. Very good. Or is it we read in as 23-24? Okay. Next up, item 9.2, information only. Mr. Jaster. Thank you. Uh, sadly, MPS lost six former employees in the month of April, and so the board and staff extend their sympathy to the following families. First, uh, Norman Retzloff passed away April 10th, 2023. Norm had been a building manager for both Adams Elementary and Midland High School. He retired in 2020 with 26 years of service. Uh, next, Mary Lou Kelly passed away April 18th, 2023. Mary Lou is a first grade teacher at Adams Elementary, as well as a reading support teacher at various other MPS elementary buildings. She retired in 1984 with 19 years of service. Um, Alice Alicia Campbell passed away April 20th, 2023. She was a second grade teacher at Adams and Longview as well. And she served as a counselor district wide 
uh, for some time as well. She retired in 1994, 25 years of service to her credit. Next, Mr. Paul Schultz passed away April 26, 2023. Paul was a band director at Northeast, as well as band director, orchestra conductor at Northeast Jefferson, Dow High, and several MPS elementary buildings. He retired in 1997, 36 years of service. Um, also, Clifford Mayers passed away April 29th, 2023. Clifford was head custodian for both Seabird and Woodcrest at different times, as well as substitute building managers following his retirement. He retired officially in 1994 with 33 years of service. And then lastly, Constance Connie Eaton passed away April 29th, 2023. Connie was a teacher as well as a social worker for MPS. She retired in 1996 with 25 years years of service. Thank you, Mr. Chester. The next up is item 10.1 information only. These are uh, letters to the Board of Education from the two individuals listed on the agenda. Item 10.2 is information only. That's letters from the Board of Education to the list of individuals and entities uh, on the agenda. Item 11 is scheduled activities. 11.1 .1 is the list of the remaining Board of Education meetings scheduled for 2023, ending December 18 of 2023. Uh, moving on, item 12, study discussion, 12.1. Are there any points of clarification for tonight? Just to point out that there's two meetings in June. Yes, sir. Okay, 12.2 um, announcements. Mr. Sheriff, the floor is yours. And I don't have them. Do you want to just, for budget? K-12 budget has been motion or yeah, I talk about that. You go. You can know the words better than I. Yeah. So the, yeah, the Senate and House have released their versions. Um, the House is a little further along, as I think theirs has um, gone to the committee level now, and the Senate will follow. Um, they all somewhat reflect each other. A um, little different formulas. So per pupil amount is where. We as school districts would just assume most of the money going to foundations, less categoricals. Um, and there's there's uh, one version that has more there than the others. Um, but I think by time, I, I often don't spend a lot of time into, into the meat of it because it all it is all mm -hmm. going to change by the time you get there. The gist of it is maybe the total dollars they're willing to spend, and they're all in the same ballpark then as well. It's going to be another good budget to public school systems in the state. Um, some recognition in there of that special education children cost more, um, at-risk children cost more, and so we've made uh, big gains on that component of it. Um, they are saying that mid-June we'll have a budget, and so remember, though, that we have two meetings in June. One is supposed to be only for the, a budget presentation. We often find business that we'll add in there, mm -hmm. um, and then the final one will be the adoption of the budget. There is only like 10 working days between those two meetings. And so if that budget occur, final occurs and there's not major changes, we'll probably adopt the budget as is and then make our adjustments in the first budget amendment of the following year. Rather than consensus on Friday, right? Yeah, and that probably is going to drive exactly just how much the three groups are willing to work with each other, if that's good or bad. And I have not heard any leaks on that one this time. All right, the only thing left to do, I'm sorry. Do you a point of clarification? I just sure. I before I can pay, okay, if I go back. You I may. I just want to say congratulations to the class of 2023. We will not meet again um, before graduation on the 24th, and so very excited for all of them. Looks like good weather, so hopefully Wednesday we're outside and we have that nice weather to do it. So yeah. Well, I think we have right. three board members with Kurt. Yes. Yep. Three. Am I saying that right? Correct. Yep. That's big. I don't know if we've had three. So, all we got. All good news. Okay. I uh, have a motion to adjourn. We'll Support. do a motion to adjourn. Did you make the motion, Phil? Yeah. Motion by Roush. Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 We stand adjourned. That's what we need to know.